Grantaraj Srimad Bhagavatam. This is Canto 10, Chapter 1, The Advent of Lord Krishna, Introduction. And today we're on text 54 of Vasudeva Speaks. Shri Vasudeva Uvacha Nahiyasyaste Bhayam Somya Yadvai Saha Sharirvak Putran Samarapayashya Syam Yataste Bhayamuthitam Translation and commentary by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Vasudeva said, O best of the sober, you have nothing to fear from your sister Devaki because of what you have heard from the unseen omen. The cause of death will be her sons. Therefore I promise that when she gives birth to the sons from whom your fear has arisen, I shall deliver them all unto your hands. Report. Kamsa feared Devaki's existence because after her eighth pregnancy she would give birth to a son who would kill him. Vasudeva, therefore, to assure his brother-in-law the utmost safety, promised to bring him all the sons. He would not wait for the eighth son, but from the very beginning would deliver to the hands of Kamsa all of the sons to which Devaki would give birth. This was the most liberal proposition offered by Vasudeva to Kamsa. Om Ajnana Timarantasya Gnanan Jinishalakaya Chakshur Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Sri Ruvenama Sri Chaitanya Manobhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadama Hyam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Sri Guroho Sri Yutapadakamalam Sri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Ragunathan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savathutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Ladata Shri Vishakhan Vitam Shcha He Krishna Kurna Sintho Dinavantho Jagat Patego Pesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Septa Kanshana Gaudangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Prishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Her Priye Vancha Kalpatrupyascha Kripasin Tupya Evacha Patitanam Pavane Pyo Vaishnave Pyo Namona Maha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prahunityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shivas Adi Gaud Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Lama Hare Lama Rama Rama Hare Hare Shri Vasudeva Uacha Nahi asya stevayam saumya Yadvai saha shadiravak Putran samar payishye sya yata stevayam utitam O best of the sober, you have nothing to fear from your sister Devaki because of what you have heard from the unseen omen. The cause of death will be her sons. Therefore, I promise that when she gives birth to the sons from whom your fear has arisen, I shall deliver them all unto your hands. So as Srila Prabhupada points out, <clears throat> this is a most liberal proposition by Vasudeva, and he's making a promise that he will keep. Not an easy promise to keep this one, but he kept his promise. And here some words are significant. Somya, O oh, most sober. It also means most peaceful. Somya means coming from Soma. Soma means the moon. The moon is cooling, pacifying. Uh, peaceful. So, ironically, uh, well, diplomatically, he's calling Kamsa Somya, whereas Kamsa, in fact, is completely full of anxiety, something we've heard in the previous text. So this is his diplomacy, again, as we heard yesterday, or the day before. And uh, he's assuring Kamsa that you have no fear from what you've heard from this unembodied voice. Um, I'll give you all of her sons as they're born, uh, for they're the cause of your fear. I think we can go on to the next text, uh, number 55. Shri Shuka Uvacha, Swasura Vadhan Niravrate, Kamsas Tadvakya Saravit, Vasudeva Opitam Pritaha, Prashasya Pravishad Graham. 
Srila Shukadev Goswami continued, Kamsa agreed to the logical arguments of Vasudeva, and having full faith in Vasudeva's words, he refrained from killing his sister. Vasudev, being pleased with Kamsa, pacified him further and entered his own house. Purport Although Kamsa was a sinful demon, he believed that Vasudev would never deviate from his word. The character of a pure devotee like Vasudev is such that even so great a demon as Kamsa firmly believed in his words and was satisfied. Yes, yasti bhaktira bhagavati akinchana sarvair gunais tatra samasate suraha. That's from Srimad Bhagavatam, 5th Canto, chapter 18, text number 12. Famous verse. All good attributes are present in a devotee, so much so that even Kamsa believed in Vasudeva's words, without a doubt. So once again, this is the power of Vasudeva's word. Uh, even Kamsa would believe it. And of course, Kamsa would believe Vasudeva's word because Vasudeva kept his word in general. And we'll see that in this case also he kept his word, however difficult it was to do that. Text 56. Athakala upavrte devaki sarva devata putran prasushave chashtao kanyam chaivanu vatsaran. Each year thereafter, in due course of time, Devaki, the mother of God and all the demigods, gave birth to a child. Thus, she bore eight sons, one after another, and a daughter named Subhadra. Purport The spiritual master is sometimes glorified as Sarva Deva, Deva Mayo Guruhu. That's from Srimad Bhagavatam 11th Canto, uh, 7th chapter, text 27. Anybody know the whole verse? Acharyam Mam Vijaniyan. Nava manyeta karhichit. Namartya buddhyasu yeta saravadeva mayoguruhu. That is to say that one should never, um, well, one should, Krishna says, one should consider the acharya to be myself, verily. And one should never think less of him, na ava manyeta, at any time, karhichit. Why? Because. He is the sum total of all the David demigods, Sarva Deva Mayo Guruhu, and uh, one should never therefore think of him as an ordinary man, nor should one envy him. Namartya, uh, Namartya Buddhya Asuyeta. One should not envy him, thinking him that thinking that he's on our platform, because he's not. By the grace of the Guru, Srila Prabhupada continues, the spiritual master. One can understand the different kinds of devas. The word deva refers to God, the supreme personality of Godhead, who is the original source of all the demigods, who are also called devas. In fact, any representative of these authorities is also called deva. Like, therefore, we have Nara Deva is the king, Guru Deva, the spiritual master, even Pati Deva, the husband. So this is the idea, Deva. Deva means someone who is in the sky, uh, Divi, and Divya also. <clears throat> in Bhagavad Gita 10.12, the Lord says, Aham Adirhi Devanam, I am the source of all the Devas. The Supreme Lord, Vishnu, the original person, expands in different forms. Tad Aikshita Bahusyam. That's from Chandogya Upanishad 6 2 3. He alone has expanded into many. Advaitam Achitam Anadim Anantarupam. That's from Brahma Samhita 533. There are different grades of forms known as Swamsha and Vibhinnamsha. The Swamsha expansions, or Vishnu Tattva, are the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Whereas the Vibhinnangsha are the Jiva Tattva, who are part and parcel of the Lord. Mamai Vangsho Jiva Loke Jiva Bhuta Sanatanaha. If we accept Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, 
and worship him, all the parts and expansions of the Lord are automatically worshipped. Sarvarham achyate jya. That's from Bhagavatam 4.31.14. Anybody know that verse? Yes, ha toror mulanishechenena. Tripyanti yat skanda pujopashaka. Prano paharacha yatendriyanam. Satachita sarvarham achyate jya. Um, so Krishna is known as Achita, Sena Yorubha Yor Matya Ratham Stapaya Mechita, Arjun says that in Bhagavad Gita. By worshipping Achita, Krishna, one automatically worships all the demigods. There is no need of separately worshipping either the Vishnu Tattva or the Jiva Tattva. If one concentrates upon Krishna, one worships everyone. Therefore, because Mother Devaki gave birth to Krishna, she is described here as Sarva Devata. Sarva Devata means um, basically personification of all the devas. In this verse, she gave birth to eight sons one after another, and then finally a daughter named Subhadra. We know Subhadra, we worship Subhadra on our altar. Uh, before Subhadra came, eight other sons, and they were killed each year, uh, or at least they were given the Kamsa each year by Vasudeva. So imagine what Devaki must have thought. Her firstborn son was delivered. The next year, her next son was delivered. The next year, Another son was given to Kamsa, who intended to kill them all. The next year, another son was given. She lost. She lost another son the following year. In the sixth year, she lost another son. In the seventh year, she lost another son. Imagine. Really, we can't imagine. And yet, just as Vasudev kept this difficult promise, just to uphold his own uh, character, his own virtue, his own honesty, Similarly, <clears throat> out of chastity and faith and humility, Devaki cooperated with her husband's request and she delivered her sons. They were her sons too. We can get some sense of the character of the pure devotees in the spiritual world, those who are qualified to participate in Krishna's Leela. Uh, let's go on to text 57. Kirti mantam prathamajam kamsayana kadundabhi arapayam asa krachrena soin lartad ati vihwalaha. Vasudeva was very much disturbed by fear of becoming a liar by breaking his promise. Thus, with great pain, he delivered his firstborn son named Kirtiman into the hands of Kamsa. Purport, in the Vedic system, as soon as a child is born, especially a male child, the father calls for learned brahmanas, and according to the description of the child's horoscope, the child is immediately given a name. This ceremony is called Namakarana. There are ten different samskaras, or reformatory methods, adopted in the system of Varnashram Dharma, and the name-giving ceremony is one of them. Although Vasudeva's first son was to be delivered into the hands of Kamsa, the Namakarana ceremony was performed, and thus the child was named Kirtiman. Such names are given immediately after birth. So Vasudev kept his promise, he delivered this child, but he, he wasn't thinking that, let me just, why bother with all this ritual? Let me just give the child to Kamsa immediately. He's going to be killed anyway. What difference does it make? The difference it makes is that this child was benefited and Kamsa was also benefited by performing the samskars as per the injunctions of the, of the scriptures. Srila Prabhupada comments in Chaitanya Charitamrita about the birth of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu when all the women of the neighborhood were bringing so many auspicious articles to offer to the baby. Um... And they were following so many rituals that are traditional in that regard. 
as Vasudev did here. Srila Prabhupada comments, everybody used to know these things in those days in Vedic culture. Nowadays, everybody has forgotten them. And when a child is born, after he's slapped by the nurses, then he's washed with an antiseptic, and that concludes everything. <laughs> so this wasn't Vasudev's idea. Um, so here it says, and the first thing is that Vasudev was very much disturbed by fear of becoming a liar, by breaking his promise. This is something that we can all take note of, how much attached he was to this. We would consider, in the mode of what we consider yukta vairagya, that um, it's probably just as well to give up your promise if that's in the best interest of expedience. Uh, but this wasn't Vasudev's attitude. So it's really an inconceivable virtue for those of us who are living in Kali Yuga to deliver one's sons and one's wife's sons uh, for eight years in a row to someone that you know is going to kill them um, just in order to keep your word. It's pretty hard for us to understand that. We're too practical. So, but this was what he did. And uh, Prabhupada doesn't really comment on that, but he, he does mention that... Uh, the importance of the samskaras, there are ten different samskaras, beginning with Garbhadhan samskar. That is to say, the parents, even before conception, they prepare their consciousness very carefully. And um, because they know that according to our consciousness, we're going to attract a certain kind of person. Just like, practically speaking, even in terms of social intercourse, what to speak of sexual intercourse, if someone is cultivating a particular kind of consciousness, then he's going to attract some other people who are in the same mode of consciousness. And he's going to <clears throat> get the results of that cultivation and that association. So similarly, in regards to giving birth, uh, even before the child is uh, conceived, the consciousness has to be appropriate uh, to the kind of child that one wants. If one wants a child who is like a cat and dog, then one can have sex indiscriminately like cats and dogs, and he will get a cat or a dog with two legs for a son. That's called Dvipada Pashu. As we've said many times, humanity is not biologically defined, it's defined in terms of dharma. So dharma is especially known as Varnashram dharma, as Prabhupada mentions here. He did consider it to be the remaining 50% of his mission in ISKCON, uh, just days before he left this world. And he gave most of his instructions on it in the later years that he was with us. So Prabhupada emphasized this, he, and particularly here in this eighth canto, uh, here and elsewhere, Srila Prabhupada emphasizes the importance of samskara in purifying one's mind-body complex. In chapter 16 of Bhagavad Gita, uh, Krishna gives some symptoms of knowledge. Uh, does anybody know? Uh, not chapter 16, I'm sorry. Chapter 16 is dealing with the divine and the demoniac qualities. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. You know, in chapter 16, Krishna is mentioning the godly qualities in the first few verses. And the first one is what? Anybody remember? Chapter 16, text number 1. Abhayam sattva samshudhir. So the first thing is abhaya, fearlessness. Fearlessness comes when, to the extent that we are in our original God consciousness. If we look away from Krishna or seek something non-Krishna, then a fear will join us at that point and stay with us until we give up that consciousness. Here, Kamsa is uh, twisted and anxious out of his fear. Uh, Vasudeva has addressed him as Somya, even though he's anything but Somya. He's not at all peaceful. He's completely agitated. Um, transcendentally, even Vasudeva was uh, worried. He was uh, very much aggrieved that, you know, my name should not be sullied, that I should not uh, debase my character through lying, because we learn from the eighth canto that Mother Earth can bear anything except for the weight of a sinful liar. So lying is very inauspicious activity, and Vasudev wanted to have nothing to do with it. That's something we can learn from his example. But um, Sri 
Srila Prabhupada was stressing the importance of these Varnashram uh, dharmas, and Varnashram dharma is a general uh, catch-all term for the entire uh, plethora of uh, traditional uh, practices and rituals that are performed within it, including these ten samskars. It's said in the Shastra, Srila Prabhupada quotes uh, from a source that I don't know. He says, um, Janmana jayate shudra, one is born as Shudra automatically, every one of us. Samskara to bhavet dvija, but through samskaras one can become twice born. In other words, one becomes really human, at least of the higher classes, the Vaishyas, the Kshatriyas, and the Brahmins. They can take second birth, which is initiation. Veda parhat bhavet vipra, one becomes a vipra, a learned scholar, pandit, uh, by study of the Vedas. And Brahma Jana Titi Brahmanaha. The Brahmana is called the person who really knows Brahma, the absolute truth, spiritual reality, who is spiritually, well, self realized and God realized. So it's not really a very cheap thing just to become a Brahmana. Really, it means you have to be a Vaishnava. They're synonymous because Brahman and Parabrahmana are one and the same thing. So <clears throat> Vasudeva performed Krishna's Namakarana, at least to set the example. Uh, Krishna says this in Bhagavad Gita as well, that um, loka sankraha me vapi, even if only for the sake of social solidarity, loka sangraham, uh, one should follow these dharmas just to set a proper example. And as we were mentioning, Krishna says in the beginning of chapter 16, the first quality, the godly quality, is fearlessness. The second one is a very important one that's not easy to understand. Sattva samshuddhi. What does that mean? Sattva samshuddhi. Prabhupada translates it here in chapter 16 as a purification of one's existence. Anybody have any comments on this? What does it mean to purify one's existence? Che, purifying the heart, certainly. That's definitely part of this process. Developing Brahminical qualities, certainly that will happen as well, as we mentioned earlier. Yasyasti bhakti or bhagavati akinchana. By following the process of bhakti, one does automatically purify the heart, and when the heart, as the heart becomes purified commensurately, these godly qualities come out because they're actually within us all. Nitya siddha. So, as I understand it, at least, the purification of one's existence, let's see what Prabhupada says here. First thing he mentions here is uh, Varnashram Dharma in its purport. But there are so many, he says, there are so many rules and regulations to be followed, particularly in the renounced order of life. Most important of all, a sannyasi is strictly forbidden to have any inter intimate relationship with a woman. Um, the, the, the our charges have commented on the Bhagavad Gita verse, this uh, godly qualities in various ways. So one has to follow one's dharma. If one is a sannyasi, of course, one has to be very strictly celibate and avoid the opposite sex or any sexual interest. Nowadays, you have to guard both bases, I suppose. Um, so purification of one's existence really means purification of the mind-body complex because the soul is already pure. <laughs> so purification of the heart, as he said, uh, you know, the Atman, it means the body, it means the mind, it means the soul as well. We have to purify the mind and the body. They require purification. The way that they are purified is through these samskars and through following one's dharma, and especially through following Paro dharma, Bhagavata dharma, the supreme dharma. Because after all, everyone has his individual dharma that's relative to the material body that one is currently incarcerated in. After that body ends, that dharma is no longer valid or needed. One, but one always has this eternal dharma, sanatan dharma, of becoming Krishna conscious. And the nature of bhakti is that it includes all these lesser dharmas, including varnashram and some scars, etc., etc. But they are important. It's just like we emphasize that chanting Hare Krishna is the Yuga Dharma for this age, one can gain all perfection simply by chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare, 
And yet still we do other things. We also do deity worship, as Pancharatrik Vidhi. We also, um, so many other things. We take prasadam, we associate with Vaishnavas, here Srimad Bhagavatam, etc., etc. So um, it's all part and parcel. And th therefore these things are also even in the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is meant for Paramahamsas. And it's, and it's an eternally liberated literature. Uh, all these things are very important. So, um, Vasudev, uh, he performed Krishna's Namakana in a ceremony, and Srila Prabhupada saw fit to comment on this and take note that these ten different samskaras are adopted in the Varnashram Dharma. Um, that was the only samskar that he could perform. Presumably he had already performed the Garbhadan samskar because after birth he had promised, that was his promise. He will give them, upon their being born, he would deliver them immediately to Kamsa. And uh, that was the only one he had time to do. Should we go on or should we stop here? 8.12. There's one very nice verse following, very poetic. Uh, he asks a rhetorical question, Vasudev. Um, Kim dusaham nusadhunam vidusham kim apekshitam Kim akaryam kadaryanam dustyajam kim tridatmanam. That means, what is painful for saintly persons who strictly adhere to the truth? Next question. How could there not be independence for pure devotees who know the Supreme Lord as the substance? Next question. What deeds are forbidden for persons of the lowest character? Final question, and what cannot be given up for the sake of Lord Krishna by those who have fully surrendered at his lotus feet? In other words, what will a saintly person not tolerate? What will a wise person uh, 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 not, uh, how can a wise person be neglected? Uh, what, what is uh, beyond the scope of uh, possibility for an evil person to do? And how can one who has actually conquered his self, uh, uh, what, what could not be uh, given up for the sake of the Supreme Lord among such persons? Vasudev is placing this rhetorical question. Purport by Srila Prabhupada, since the eighth son of Devaki was to kill Krishna, one might ask what the need was for Vasudev to deliver the firstborn child. As Prabhupada already said, this was a most liberal promise, so one could reasonably raised this question. The answer is that Vasudev had promised Kamsa that he would deliver all the children born of Devaki. Kamsa, being an Asura, did not believe that the eighth child would kill him. He took it for granted that he might be killed by any of the children of Devaki. As we remember, this was a doubt that was uh, as well um, nourished by Narad Muni. Um, so Vasudev, therefore, to save uh, Devaki, promised to give Kamsa every child, whether male or female. From another point of view, Vasudev and Devaki were very pleased when they understood that the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna would come as their eighth son. Vasudeva, a pure devotee of the Lord, was eager to see Krishna appear as his child from the eighth pregnancy of Devaki. Therefore, he wanted to deliver all the children quickly so that the eighth would come and Krishna would appear. He begot one child every year so that Krishna's turn to appear would come as soon as possible. You see, the devotees are always very eager. That was, in, that was in fact, the same motivation for Nadad Muni to go and urge Kamsa to start speeding things up. He wanted, to, he wanted to up the ante. He wanted, he wanted Krishna to appear as soon as he could. So a very nice verse. It's worthy to remember this one. What's not tolerable for the sadhus? Vasudeva is asking this rhetorical question. But even though it's a rhetorical question here, there is an answer for it. Does anyone know? What's not tolerable for the sadhus? This is a little bit esoteric. I just happened to come across this the other day while reading the commentaries on, um, where was this, in Bhagavad Gita. Anyway, the Acharyas say, maybe it was Bhagavatam, I don't remember, but the Acharyas have said that uh, for the sadhu, 
The pain of another person is dusaham. That's the word used here in text 58. Dusaham, difficult to tolerate. Another's pain, paradukha. Paradukham. He's paradukaduki. He becomes miserable in seeing another's pain. So. Also, yeah. So vidusham kima pekshitam, kima karyam kadaryanam. This is the real point here that he knew that there's nothing that this person might not do. Kamsa, he can do anything. So this this judgment came tridatmanam because he was tridatmana, he was tridatma vasudev. He was able to give up even all these sons year after year after year, even though he know he knew that he was consigning them into the jaws of death. And just to uphold his word. So that's, we've gone through a few verses here. Uh, tomorrow we'll begin from text 59, and we'll stop here. Anybody have any questions or comments? Yes, Prabhu. Just a, a curiosity, I'm also wondering about that disembodied voice. Mm. Uh, was that Narada Muni? What, how do we understand that? The voice without a... Uh, yeah, the voice that called Kamsa a fool and said that the eighth son of this woman will kill you. You know, offhand, I don't know. I don't remember. Does anybody else have any? Generally, these things are just called a Akashvani, a voice from the sky. Yeah, this, this is what happens. I mean, evidently, maybe Krishna doesn't want to involve someone else or no one else is qualified or willing. So he just, he just kind of arranges that, you know, Vayu or somebody does it from out of the sky. There's a nice story about Sridhar Swami, the Bhagavatam commentator. He was living in Kashi, which is, of course, a stronghold of Shaiva worship and impersonalism. And yet he wrote this... Um, this um, Bhavartha Deepika, his famous commentary on the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is very friendly to Vaishnavism, very, I mean, pure Vaishnavism, really. And so it was looked uh, upon with some doubt by the caste Brahmins and the uh, Mayavadis and the impersonalists and Gyanis of Kashi. So they decided that there would be a test that said, we'll put this commentary in front of the deity of Kashi Vishwanath, Lord Shiva, the presiding deity of Banadas. And so they did that. They put the commentary in front of the deity and then closed the temple doors. And uh, there was no answer coming until finally um, they opened the temple doors and they saw that the Srimad Bhagavatam was still there. And then the voice came from the sky <laughs> and it vibrated this verse. Aham ved me, I know. Shuko veti, Shukadev, he knows. Vyaso veti na veti va. Vyas, the author of the book, <laughs> Sriman Bhagavatam, he may know or he may not know. Sridharo saka, Sridhara sakalam veti. Sri Narasimha prasadataha. But Sridhara, he knows everything by the grace of Narasimha. It's said that Narasimha was either his worshipable deity or the name of his spiritual master. But either way, this seems to have been the confirmation of Kashi Vishwanath on that occasion. So yeah, it's a, a Kashvani, it comes every once in a while. We can look it up, I suppose it must be somewhere and described here in this uh, passage. I just offhand, I don't remember. Yeah, very dramatic, definitely. Just like sometimes also Krishna takes the form of some old Brahmin who just wanders in out of town from nobody knows who he is and he yeah, this is what he does, just to, uh, just to, just to increase the drama. Yeah, very nice. This, therefore, he's called Noto Natya Taroyata. Like a dramatic actor, he comes and performs his pastimes. And he knows how to, he has all the theatrical effects. There are the sounds and the lights and all the, <laughs> everything. Just like we'll see later on when Krishna is born, actually. You know, the, the, the thundering of the rumbling of the thunder and all the guards falling asleep and Vasudev coming out and he's totally anxious and, after all that he's been through already, can you imagine? They're raging Yamana, and he's got his little son, newborn son in a basket, and he just doesn't know when those guards are going to wake up. And I, you can't imagine the anxiety he must have been in. Again, I like to point out, in these circumstances, he hadn't read the script. 
<laughs> he didn't know what was, that it was just a little while longer. He thought, oh, God only knows how many years this is going to go on. We also experience this in our Christian consciousness. We don't know. It could be that this afternoon Krishna gives you his complete mercy and takes you back to Godhead. We just don't know. You may get love of Godhead tomorrow by Kripa Siddha. It's possible. We just don't know. But the idea is that Krishna always arranges these things just to increase the dramatic effect of his lila and just to intensify the love of his devotees and to reciprocate with them in so many ways. And, and it's all bliss, ultimately. When we see it properly, it's all bliss. Uh, when we're covered over by maya, then we think it's misery. But uh, we read in Brihad Bhagavatamritam that when Gopakumar went back to Godhead, he looked around and he said, I couldn't understand whether all these people are wandering around and experiencing the, 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 the depths of the most extreme agony or the, or the heights of the, most, uh, the, the top most possible bliss. <laughs> he, I, I couldn't make it out. It's either one or the other. I, I'm not really sure. So Krishna consciousness is like that. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Truthfulness and lying. Devotees downplay the importance of truthfulness a lot. They say that Maharaj Yudhisthira was supposed to be great for for being honest, but actually he was really great. I mean, it was actually uh, bad because he didn't say that Ashwatthama was dead when Krishna wanted him to, because he was hesitating to lie. Yeah. So, you know, often the devotees will say, well, you know, if lying is what it, what, what it takes to serve Krishna, then that's what we have to do. But then this was stressing a lot how yeah. that uh, Vaishnava doesn't lie. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting contrast, isn't it? We, we do have, we have a tendency in modern society, I think, probably more due to the influence of Kali Yuga than through the uh, influence of Paramatma, um, you know, to, to, to downplay the importance of being honest. But these are sub-religious principles, which is to say, sub-religious means not that it's less important than your spiritual life, but that it's the substrate of your spiritual life, that you don't have a spiritual life if you don't have this foundation. Unless there's honesty, nothing else works because it's the only remaining leg of religion in this age. So it is very important. And uh, as we mentioned already, it's confirmed in the Srimad Bhagavatam, even Bhumi Devi cannot stand a liar on the surface of her globe. She, can, she holds up everything. The name of Bhumi is mentioned, Dharati, one who bears everything, but she cannot bear the weight of a sinful liar, somebody who is not honest. So, yeah, this is something very, uh, you know, it's, we, in the spirit of what we think is Yukta Vairagya, we're prepared to lie for Krishna. And we do see uh, there are examples of those devotees who have done that, as you mentioned. Yudhishthira Maharaj is one. Um, you know, Sanatan Goswami wasn't really lying, but it was, you know, he was bribing the jailkeeper to get him out. I mean, he, he told a white lie, I suppose you could say. So we see both examples there. The real thing is this, that to follow Krishna's instructions, to follow the instructions of the spiritual master, and... Um, that is, that is what should dictate us. If we need to lie for Krishna, then so be it. If we need to kill our parents for Krishna, then so be it. But these things do not happen very easily, very cheaply, very often. Uh, and you'd better be sure that it's Krishna dictating. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to suffer a sinful reaction, period. That's how karma works. There was an interesting quote I came across the other day. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said that Preaching Krishna consciousness, uh, if it's materially motivated, it falls within the category as, of karma. It's not spiritual. Think about that. So everything else as well. We, we, we accrue karma for anything that we're not doing on behalf of the company. Prabhupada says a, a peon working for a big corporation, he may be responsible for transferring millions of dollars through, you know, various accounts. But if he keeps, as soon as he keeps one farthing for himself, he's legally accountable and he will be prosecuted. And it's the same thing in Krishna consciousness. There's so many, any number of things that we can do for Krishna 
as we're properly guided by Krishna or his representatives. But as soon as we take something for ourselves, either out of foolishness or out of self-motivation, then we get snagged in the karma, and it pulls us down. The beauty of, of Krishna's system is such that we, he gives us enough rope and we hang ourselves with it if we're not sincere. It just takes time. Yeah, therefore, therefore I was stressing that Vasudev kept his word, and that's something we can take note of. Anything else? Yes. Hare Krishna Prabhu, thank you for the class. Uh, you mentioned that Srila Prabhupada considered that the Varnashrama system is the remaining 50% of his mission. That's what he said. How dependent or independent is our spiritual life of establishing the Varnashrama system? To the editors of the volume of uh, quotes com uh, on Varnashram, compiled um, by a couple of God brothers, God sisters of mine, uh, they felt, in doing extensive research into all of Prabhupada's books about this topic, that in the context of most of the instructions that Srila Prabhupada gave on Varnashram Dharma was an in-house uh, kind of a thing means that Prabhupada apparently intended most of his instructions on Varnashram to be not something that we would present to the public, but that something that we would assimilate ourselves. And by our having assimilated it, the public would follow that example. That said, um, coupled with the fact that Prabhupada gave about 80% of those instructions in the last three years that he was with us, and evidently um, inspired by his observation that his disciples were falling down, that they were having material difficulties, um, that they were not keeping their vows, that they were leaving Krishna consciousness, that they were swapping wives, they were doing so many things. Uh, it would seem that Prabhupada felt that Varnashram was the necessary agent of stabilization to provide the sattva samshuddhi, as we discussed earlier, purification of one's existence, in order to really sustain uh, Krishna consciousness, a mature commitment and conviction and practice of Krishna consciousness. This is supported by Krishna himself in Bhagavad Gita chapter 27, uh, chapter 7, text 28, wherein he says, yesham tvantakatam papam jananam punya karnamanam te, uh, those persons who are not only freed from um, their sinful activities and the reactions of their sinful activities, um, but also who are fixed in pious activity in this life. Pious activity means dharma, and specifically uh, samskars, dharma, you know, sadachar, etc., Krishna says, Te dvanva moha nirmukta. They will become freed from the illusions that follow from sinful activity and from too much uh, enamor, uh, you know, too much intoxication with duality in general. They will become freed from that. And as a result of that, that, you know, relative liberation from inauspiciousness, they will be able to worship me with firm conviction. So it seems to me that Srila Prabhupada intended this Varanashram to act as the substrate of pure devotional service. Because if you study very carefully the commentaries of Acharyas on chapters 3 through 5 of Bhagavad Gita, it's very, very clear there that they consider um, transcendental knowledge can arise in someone who is very fixed in pure activity, good behavior, and performing dharma. Um, that is, in fact, traditionally, as far as social conventions go or spiritual religious conventions go, that was traditionally always considered to be the prerequisite for Vedanta study. Um, Jaimini's Dharma Sutra begins, uh, recognizably, with the aphorism, Athato Dharma Jignasa. Now let us inquire into Dharma. Because unless you're fixed in dharma, there's no, you, you just don't have the adhikar to understand brahma. It's not possible. 
You have to have good character, sadachar, first. You have to be a civilized human being. In other words, Krishna consciousness is only meant for human beings. Animals cannot take to Krishna consciousness. And humanity is not defined as the biological result of the sexual intercourse of male and female of the human species. Humanity is rather defined by adherence to these codes of dharma. If one doesn't follow these codes of dharma, he is not a human or he's partially human. These are strong statements, but they need to be made because it seems to me that they're not understood, that this principle is not understood. Um, so traditionally, a Vedanta study, Shankaracharya would not accept anyone as a disciple unless he was, you know, I mean, none of the Acharyas would accept anyone as a disciple unless he was checked out, trained up, and, and known to be of good character. That's why some scars are so important. That's why family traditions are so important. Uh, that's why Varnashram Dharmas are so important. It really does matter. It does impact our spiritual life in a major way. So, Yesham Tvantikatam Papam, that's the idea that Krishna's saying it at the conclusion of chapter 7, which comes after all these instructions on dharma. But it's quite clear from the Acharya's commentaries on the chapters dealing with karma yoga that it is a prerequisite for knowledge. If you are fixed in dharma, then you can, the, the fruit of following your dharma and being fixed in pious activity, pious behavior, is that you have the ability to, to develop transcendental knowledge. If you try to cultivate transcendental knowledge before you're sinless or before you're fixed in piety, you will pervert that transcendental knowledge. You'll misinterpret, you'll twist and twangle it according to your wacko desires, and uh, that we've seen also in many cases. What's a good uh, uh, case in point? Hitler. <laughs> he had many, he had a lot of faith in Vedic literature. He had many good ideas drawn from Vedic literature, but because they were sinful, they were twisted uh, in a terrible way. And everybody knows the result of that. But we've seen enough of the same, I think, in our society. And Srila Prabhupada saw enough of the same in our society. Therefore, he gave that instructions many times, more than once. It was quite clear. He considered it a very, very important thing, chiefly for the members of ISKCON. Because until we do it, nobody else is going to do it. Is that clear? Jai Kesh. Hare Krishna. We actually were just talking about this yesterday. Um, as far as Varnashram, just on the basis of farm communities. And what I was saying was just the fact that it increases the quality of one's devotion to Krishna if you can grow your own food and offer that to Krishna rather than buy from somebody else or give Krishna fresh milk from a cow or it just increases one's own quality of offering, one's own quality of existence, which in turn then purifies one. Yeah, I mean, even, even looking at it from a medical perspective, in terms of Ayurveda, all the constituent elements of our physical body, and our mental body for that matter, the microcosm you might call it, they exist in the macrocosm, and they interact with the macrocosm. They're coming into your body from outside, and they're leaving your body from inside. They're going back outside from it. There's an interchange of these material um, planets and their influence and the subtle energies called pranas. And our health and welfare, materially speaking, it depends on that. If the, if the, if the channels of that transmission are blocked through pungent activity, or through pungent association, then that impacts your health, which impacts your consciousness, which impacts your spiritual cultivation. So in the modern society, especially, you know, you cannot underestimate the ill effects that are produced from a lot of the technology that we use every day, and certainly the psychological impacts of things like television, but even a lot of the nonsense that's available on the internet. And there are so many, you, you really are not given a choice by the uh, multinational tele, telecom corporations. They don't really regard your input as to whether they're going to put up cell towers everywhere in the world. But you have to consider the effects of electromagnetic frequencies 
on your subtle and gross material body. <laughs> you know, so simple living really, it, it, it is a very real thing, even though it's too, too subtle for those in the modes of passion and ignorance to understand. It's like, how do you, how do you express the subtlety of a classical raga to someone who only knows heavy metal music? It's not very easy. Rup Goswami is, I mean, the same thing actually holds for spiritual life. According to Yamanacharya, Krishna is the abode, Vishnu is the abode of all wonderful qualities, but those of a demoniac temperament will never be able to appreciate them. They can't see it. They're blind to it. And the same thing is true on a, on a material level as well. I mean, to the extent that we have an elevated consciousness or have purified our material existence, because material existence is the only thing that can really be purified. You know, to that extent, we can appreciate things that are more elevated and more subtle. And to the extent that we haven't purified our existence, we remain covered over and, and pose a threat to the rest of society and those who are trying to cultivate higher consciousness. So we don't want to become as much a part of the problem as, as you know, the, that we're trying to solve. I was talking with a devotee the other day about devotees who go to India and, and assume naively that you're just taking from India rather than giving. You know, the effects that ISKCON has had, negative effects that ISKCON has had on India, on Indian society, they're numerous. And we need to be aware of that. It's kind of like Americans, uh, they're the only ones who speak English without any kind of accent. Have you noticed? I mean, this is, the end, this is the mentality, you know? I mean, the other people, you know, Australians have an Australian accent, the British have a British accent. We speak the pure English. This is like, the, you know, this is, the, this, is the, this is the real thing. This is the essence. I mean, that's, that, this is the problem, you see? It's egocentric. So I like that. I don't know, I'm just kind of rambling now, but is, is that okay? Anything else? Okay, it's getting late now, so we should stop. Thank you very much. All glory to Shirley Prabhupada.